Welcome to the 9th Annual Lab Quality Confab, sponsored by The Dark Report, November 3rd and 4th of 2015 in New Orleans. The title of this presentation is Using Real-Time Data to Assess Non-Confirming Events, Identify Key Indicators of Quality, and Meet AABB and CAP Requirements in Blood Banks and Labs. The presenter is Randy German, Blood Bank and Laboratory Quality Manager at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach, California. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. Just a few disclosures. I'm going to be talking about an occurrence tracking information system called Otis, and I do sit on their advisory council, although I have no financial ties to the company. And ho my hospital was a development site for um, Otis, and we continue to serve as a beta site for new releases. And I'm a lifelong blood banker. And um, about a year and a half ago, we um, outsourced our donor program at the hospital, and I was offered the opportunity to become the laboratory um, quality and compliance manager for the whole lab, and I reluctantly accepted that. So this is my very first non-blood bank conference. So my boss is very happy that I'm here, and I'm happy to be here. I'm going to learn a lot this week. So we're really trying to standardize um, quality and compliance across sections of the laboratory. So historically at our hospital, each section was doing their own thing um, in terms of quality and compliance. And we're trying to standardize um, NCE reporting, quality control review, um, training and, and um, uh, compliance documentation so that when the inspector comes, no matter what section they um, go to, it all looks the same. So we're trying to take some of the best practices from the blood bank and extend that across the laboratory. And this, is, uh, this subject is NCE reporting. That was one of my first projects is to implement that um, lab-wide. Uh, my other disclosure is that it's 5 o'clock California time, so. Um, <clears throat> so just some objectives. We're going to slog through some of the regulatory requirements really quickly. Um, and I think you'll gain an understanding, you're probably familiar with many of them, that virtually every regulatory um, um, uh, group requires some kind of NCE reporting. Um, really demonstrate how NCE tracking can be a cornerstone of quality improvement and how it can work to help you select your KIQs. Um, how many are still doing on paper um, occurrence reporting? Or does everybody have an electronic system? So, I hope to talk about um, the benefits of electronic NCE reporting. It's very difficult to do on paper effectively. Describe what features to look for when choosing an electronic system. And then um, key to success in my mind is effective root cause analysis and um, developing a blame-free or a just culture is any terminology. So a little bit about Hogue Hospital. We're in Newport Beach. We have two campuses, 500 and 100 beds. We are not a trauma center, but have a very busy labor and delivery unit. Um, laboratory is moderate size, about 1.5 million build tests and 130 FTEs. This is a picture of our Newport Beach campus, the East Tower, the big one opened in 2005, and um, right there is Pacific Coast Highway. There's beautiful views of the ocean from the seventh floor, but guess where the lab is? It's in the basement. So we don't see much of the ocean from the laboratory, and this is our Irvine campus that opened in 2010. So the history of NCE reporting at our hospital is in 1992. As I mentioned, we did have a donor program at the hospital, so we were very heavily um, inspected by the FDA. And in 92, we actually received a 483 for failure to adequately follow up on problems. And in 95, the FDA mandated electronic um, biologic product deviation reporting for both blood banks and transfusion services. And in 96, we developed a paper program for both the general laboratory and the blood bank. And in 2005, we noticed that the FDA would come in and say, let me see your last 10 reportable and non-reportable BPDs. So there was an in they'd always start the inspection looking at our non-conforming events. So there was increasing emphasis on BPD reporting, at least in the blood bank. And in 2006, we received another 483 for failure to report within 45 days. And that's when we realized we really needed an electronic system, which was developed in, um, later that year. And the ABB actually gave us a best practice for that um, system in 2009. And then in 2011, we rolled that out to the rest of the laboratory outside of the blood bank. So let's slog through some of these regulatory requirements. The CAP certainly requires um, a system to identify and evaluate errors, both internally and um, outside sources from complaints uh, from patients, physicians, and nurses, and that is a phase two. Um, the program must be implemented in all sections of the laboratory and all shifts, and you must document investigation and resolution of problems. You must perform root cause analysis. Um, 
of any unexpected event involving death or serious physical injury. That is the definition of a sentinel event from Jaco. And you have to include near misses, even if it didn't um, result in actual harm. And you should um, tailor your risk reduction strategies around those root cause analysis. Um, you must have key indicators of quality in all three phases of testing. You should try to benchmark it when you can. And these are some of the suggested key indicators of quality from the CAP. And the ones um, highlighted in orange, it's a little more yellow on the screen, um, are all the ones that you can actually mine from your non-conforming event data. The AABB certainly requires um, um, non-conforming events, including, there's that word, including near-miss events. So even if it didn't reach the patient, you should still investigate. And all the regulatory agencies talk about document. Um, looking at both actual events and near miss. And again, you must um, have a process for corrective action, um, and these are some of the elements you should have in your report. Description, investigation, corrective action, and then you should follow up to make sure that corrective action um, was effective. Now, the Joint Commission has a whole plethora of um, regulations around um, non-conforming events. I'm not sure what that is. Um, the scope of the program, um, again, um, should cover near misses, close calls, or good catches. Leadership provide and encourage use of a blame-free internal reporting system. Um, and we'll talk a lot about blame-free in a moment. Hospitals should use data to, to, guide, to guide their decision-making and understand variation. Um, you must uh, conduct thorough and credible root cause analysis in response to sentinel events. That includes action plans you need to implement and monitor. And you should focus on not the individual, but on the system that allowed the error to occur. And we'll talk about that again when we talk about um, a just culture. Uh, sentinel or reviewable events, anything that resulted in unanticipated death or permanent loss of function, um, even if they didn't result in um, that, it needs to be um, reviewed. And one of the... Um, since I'm a blood banker, I have to throw a blood bank example in there. Hemolytic transfusion reaction due to major blood group incompatibility. Um, you don't have to report, but it's highly encouraged that you report your sentinel events. Um, and again, this talks about the development of a just culture. All individuals who work in hospitals are able to openly discuss issues of safety and quality. Leaders provide, again, blame-free um, environment and um, the hospital collects data on staff suggestions. So in our non-conforming event system, we have a field for the employee to put in a suggestion on how to prevent a recurrence of that or a suggestion to system changes, and we get a lot of interesting information about, from that. Um, we actually are not a joint commission hospital. We're DNV, and DNV uses ISO standards, and they certainly have um, requirements for um, uh, monitoring non-conforming events as well. Um, on to the FDA and the blood bank. Um, so F blood bank's been doing non-conforming event reporting way longer than I think the rest of the industry. And since 1984, licensed blood banks were required to report anything that affected the safety, purity, or potency of a blood product. In 91, um, they expanded that requirement from donor centers to the hospitals to the transfusion services. So even if you don't have a uh, donor center on site, if you're a transfusion service and something happens that affects the safety, purity, or potency of a blood product, you are required to report that to the FDA. Um, in 95, they put out another um, guideline on quality assurance in the blood bank. Um, essential element of QA is knowledge required through these investigations. And again, they outline um, corrective action should include system or process redesign, retraining, and procedural changes. So what are you doing if you have a repeated error of the same type? Are you, are you just monitoring that, or are you making changes to prevent a recurrence? And in 2006, they put out a final rule on BPD reporting. They replaced the term error and accident with biologic product deviation. Um, both licensed and registered facilities are required to report electronically um, to the FDA within 45 days. And again, there's that requirement to investigate both actual events and near misses. Um, how many are members of CLSI um, in the audience? So CLSI, is a, there's a plethora of great information, um, Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute. It's not cheap. It's $5,000 a year to access all of their standards. Um, but I would really um, commend um, CLSI to you if you're doing quality work in your laboratory. It's an amazing um, resource. And um, one of their 12 quality system essentials is occurrence management. 
I wanted to back up a little bit and say that CLSI is referenced by many of the regulatory agencies. There's 25 standards in the CAP checklist. Um, FDA lists over 100 standards in their consensus standards database. And Joint Commission has a complete crosswalk to the CLSI standards. So it's something that I just became familiar with in the last couple of years, but it's, it's a great resource. <clears throat> These are two of the CLSI documents that I referenced for um, developing our non-conforming event system. Okay, what to report? And I'm not going to read all these to you, but um, certainly um, anything that, if undetected, would have the potential to adversely impact patient care or the accuracy of your test results. And these are just some examples. I won't read them to you, but in, you should be analyzing non-conforming events in all three phases of testing, pre-analytic, um, analytic, um, including turnaround times not met, post-analytic, wrong results filed, problems with your... Um, Electronic medical record, which we have creep up all the time. Things all of a sudden will start looking funny in the EMR. Critical values not called. Any safety events in your laboratory. And certainly customer complaints. And we encourage the staff, don't make a judgment as to the validity of the complaint. We know that many times they're not valid. But we want every complaint registered in our system so that we can follow up with our customers. And then our pathology department has developed a whole uh, list of what they... Um, consider a non-conforming event in pathology. And again, I won't read these to you, but they're there for um, your reference. Point of care has developed a list. And then we use our system. We develop specialized codes for auditing something specific. It may not even be a non-conforming event, but if, for example, um, we're having problems with samples arriving in the laboratory before the orders are placed in CPOE, which causes a big bottleneck in our processing area. So we develop a code, and we told the staff, write every one of these up so we can get a feel for how big this problem is, where it's happening, and we can provide feedback to our customers. Um, extra blood cultures and microbiology are being audited this year, and no source written on the microbiology sample label. So you can use your non-conforming event system not just for non-conforming events, but to gauge the scope of a problem and decide if you want to mount a, um, a program to improve that. It's also a good outlet for if, if the staff is complaining about something, you can just say, oh, I need an event report about that. We'll look into it. So. <laughs> and then in the blood bank, certainly um, the gold standard is anything that has the potential to um, affect safety, purity, or potency, um, any post-donation information that comes after the donation, and then we also included anything that um, delayed blood availability or preventable blood losses. And again, um, must be filed with the FDA within 45 days of discovery if the product left your control, which we defined differently in our three blood bank sections. So in the donor collections area, it was post-donation. In the donor processing area, it was if it was labeled and distributed to the transfusion service. And in the blood bank itself, is if it left the blood bank, if it was issued. And again, um, near misses are also looked at. Um, there's also requirements around anonymous reporting and certainly capturing complaints. So the CAP requires a procedure for employees and patients to communicate concerns about quality and safety. You have to have the official blue CAP sign on your wall. I'll show you that in a moment. ABB requires um, uh, an outlet for uh, personnel to anonymously communicate concerns. And CLIA um, also requires um, that you communicate how... Um, Employees or, or patients would file a complaint with CLIA. Um, and then so there are um, on the web and in the references, you'll see that CAP, ABB, and CMS instructions for filing complaints and concerns. And here we post them in the lab in the outpatient draw stations, and we have it on our um, hospital intranet. And then finally, our NCE system has an anonymous login. So if an employee wants to report something anonymously, they don't have to log in with their name. So that provides them with a, a means of reporting anonymously. And often we'll see um, complaints against another employee when they log on anonymously. So. <clears throat> this is the official cap sign. It's actually blue when you download it from the in Internet. You, they will cite you for this, so make sure before the um, next inspection you have the official cap sign posted in your laboratory. This is the AABB um, sign that you need posted in your laboratory. And this is the um, CLIA document for how patients or employees can file a complaint, and it's available at that website. And um, we put that on our intranet um, and also post it in our outpatient laboratory. <clears throat> okay, thanks for bearing with me through all of that regulatory stuff. Let's talk about, um, and this is probably review for many of you, but how to conduct an effective root cause analysis. It certainly starts 
with a good report, and that requires a lot of in-servicing on your, with your employees. And just constantly remind them, and this is the basis of a just culture, that you're writing up the problem, not the person. I can tell you some of them used to be really nasty, and we keep continually educating the staff. You're not writing up the person that allowed that to happen. You're writing up the system that allowed that to happen. Make sure you provide all relevant facts and include um, sufficient detail for follow-up and risk assessment, which is our medical director's biggest um, complaint, is there's not enough detail for her to assess risk. And you constantly have to provide the staff with training on how to do this. The next thing you want to ask when an event happens is, is, is this um, step in question covered in the SOP and was the SOP followed? This is particularly important in the blood bank. The FDA investigator will say, well, let me see the SOP step that it was involved here and wasn't followed because everything you do in the blood bank has to be in an SOP. So in our blood bank system, we actually have to insert the SOP number and have that as part of the documentation. If you don't sit down and discuss with the staff what happened, it's going to be very difficult for you to do a root cause analysis. And in our blood bank system, we actually have the employee fill out um, uh, their recollection of the events. So unless you talk to them, you don't know if it was a simple error, which is likely in 90%, 95% of the cases, or was it a competency? Did they know what to do? Did they not know what to do? Many times they'll say, well, I don't remember. That was two weeks ago. Um, so tell me how you usually do it and have them describe um, their means of doing it. And then you can assess, did, did they really know what to do or they don't? And if they don't, retraining is certainly... Um, indicated or it may just be a simple let's pull out the SOP and let's review what wasn't followed and have them state were there other contributing factors like we were understaffed. Um, so unless you talk to the employee <clears throat> it's really going to be hard for you to determine was it competency or was it a simple human error <clears throat> and certainly did more than one error contribute and we'll talk about that in a moment. So here's an example of a good report um, this is an actual example from our system of a contaminated result. So the employee put the initial values, who they talked to, their immediate corrective action, and what the retesting showed. This is an example of a less than good report, and this is an actual example from our system. Um, I spoke to Mary. She was angry. I told her that was our policy. So this is what we get a lot of, this attacking the person instead of the event. So when an error reaches a patient, you guys are probably familiar with this model, it's usually an alignment of weaknesses in the system, and this is called the Swiss cheese model. And this is an example of a mislabeled sample. The night shift tech called off, venipuncture was working a double shift. They took multiple labels into the patient room. Only one of the labels was compared to the armband, and then ultimately, because the um, labels were not generated um, from the armband, that was also a system weakness. So in this particular event, all four of those things lined up and allowed the error to reach the patient. So uh, an effective way of doing um, a root cause analysis is to constantly ask why. So in this simple example of my car won't start, if you keep asking why, you're finally going to get to the real root cause was that you didn't maintain the vehicle according to the recommended service schedule. This is a, unfortunately a real life example of a patient that received an ABO incompatible unit of blood. And when you drill down and continue to ask why, you'll find out that oftentimes the root cause is multifactorial, meaning your corrective action is going to have to address multiple causes. So in this case, the blood was requested by the ED for the incorrect patient. And the name and medical record number on the blood unit wasn't compared to the armband. Why? The nurse instructed the unit secretary for call, call, call for blood in room X, but the prior patient was still registered in that room in the tracking system. So when the unit secretary pulled it up, she called for blood on the wrong patient, and the patient didn't have an armband on. Why? Registration didn't have the patient demographics because the patient arrived in full arrest. And it turns out that their culture is they try to do everything possible to avoid registering the patient as a John Doe because that requires extra work afterwards to merge it to medical records. So you can see in this case, if we're going to address this problem, we have to address multiple errors that occurred along the way. The unit secretary, the banding problem, the failure of the nurse to compare the um, name and medical record number on the unit with the armband. So... Okay, so um, you need to document um, your immediate corrective actions in your system. What did you do right away when you discovered it? And often the text will do this. It's not our um, job to do. How did you prevent this from getting worse? And then really when you determine what your corrective actions are, um, are going to be, you need to um, decide, is this an error that occurs infrequently or is this a trend? Is it a trend by SOP, by a single employee, which may be a competency issue, 
by location, by time of day. And without an electronic system, if you're doing this on paper, it's going to be very difficult for you to trend this. Does the SOP need to be revised? Um, consider the computer. Did involved employees or other staff have suggestions for systems changes? <coughs> Is an audit retraining or observational competency indicated based on frequency? So if things are cropping up over and over, you may want to do an observational competency of all the staff in that department to see, is, this a pro is everybody having this problem? Is this problem bigger than we think? And I would really, when we first put the system in, we tried to fix everything, right? So you want to avoid making system changes until you have a trend. Because if you try to put in a double check every time there's an error, pretty soon you'll have a very non-lean system. So really target your corrective actions on those things that are high risk and that are trending. Um, you can't solve everything. You, um, so oftentimes it's just going to be simple error. So let's talk about um, the, really I think the key to success is creating a just culture. And really the term blame free suggests no accountability and that's evolved to <clears throat> the term just culture that was coined by David Marks in 2001. So just culture is simply one in which um, personnel feel comfortable disclosing errors including their own. Always assume good intentions, right? So an employee Nobody wants to come to work and do a bad job. So everybody is trying to do the best they can. So if you start there, you're going to have a much more positive experience. <clears throat> Certainly no automatic links to discipline. And really focus on analyzing the system and preventing a recurrence. And every time you sit down with an employee, you have to give that speech. Um, you have to tell them. You have to support them. Uh, they're already going to feel bad. There's nothing you can say to make them feel worse. And um, treating near misses the same as actual events both in terms of how they're investigated and repercussions for the employee is also key. <clears throat> Openly share all errors. So in the blood bank system, at least, every time a BPD occurs, we put out an email. We don't say who was involved in the event, but we say this happened. Here's how to prevent it from happening again. And if you have any suggestions on preventing a recurrence or system changes, let us know. And so it becomes sort of a... Um, um, a culture where it becomes a game to prevent recurrences. Every one of those is shared with staff. And we get a lot of ideas from them. Well, here's what I do in my system to prevent this from happening. And then we share that with everybody, even though it might not be an SOP change. It could be a personal system um, that they put in place to keep it from happening. So we share all of these suggestions. Certainly celebrating successes, supporting the employee, which I already talked about, every time. You have to restore their confidence, remind them how often they do things right, um, give feedback on suggestions. So if they submit a suggestion, acknowledge every one of those, recognize good catches, and certainly share data with staff so they can see that these NCEs aren't going into a black hole, that they're having um, impact. <coughs> I've never talked so much before 7 o'clock in the morning in my life. <coughs> Okay, so you certainly want to share data. Um, this is, happens to be our blood bank data from last fiscal year actually two fiscal years ago before we eliminated our um, donor program, but we had 10 reportable BPDs. Seven of those were not preventable because they were post-donation information. We had no adverse patient outcomes, and our BPD rate per unit transfused was 0.015% or 1 in 6,700 units, and we had them evenly across all three sections of the blood bank. So this was shared with staff, not to say you're making errors, but Look at how great we're doing. We issued 25,000 units of blood, not a single patient adverse outcome, and only three reportable errors. And so that was a means of celebration. So we turn a negative into a positive, right? And then when we looked at contributing factors, which is something we also document in our electronic system, <clears throat> not surprisingly, most of those were simply human error. I knew what to do. I understood the procedure. I just made a slip of the computer, a simple data entry error. Six of those we determined it was a competency problem. We did retraining. We had some systems problems um, that we um, learned from our trending, and we had um, three SOPs that weren't adequate. <coughs> so out of that program that year, we revised 10 SOPs. We did 10 retrainings. We did some manufacturer notifications for equipment problems. We did four major systems changes. We conducted audits to see if there was a deeper problem with our cord blood testing and one method validation. 
And so at the end of the year, we incorporate this into our annual report, and we share it with staff. Look at what came out of all the work that you did reporting your non-conforming events, and really celebrate our successes. You've made this a safer place for our patients. So um, is discipline ever indicated? So the term blame-free, in my mind, is not a good one. I prefer just culture, because certainly there are times when discipline is indicated, and this is a good list. Impairment due to drugs or alcohol, premeditated and intentional disregard for policy, particularly uh, critical control points, which I'll define for you in a moment, falsification of records, failure to report, including uh, self-reporting, this... Um, you want to make sure if you are going to do discipline that the step missed is documented in your policy and included in your training modules. And then certainly repeat errors of the same type. The person's making a blood typing error 28 times last month to, despite being retrained over and over. There's nothing else we can do except discipline in that case. So there are times when it can lead to discipline, but certainly not on a regular basis. And it's been a long time since we've um, counseled an employee through um, progressive discipline because of NCEs. Now, certainly, NCEs can be an objective measure of performance. Um, and in our criteria-based evaluation, it used to say no more than a two occurrences since the previous evaluation. That's a very negative statement. We've turned that around to say responds in a positive manner when discussing errors and offers suggestions for error prevention. And we don't even talk about the error rate at the time of evaluation. You know, you shouldn't use the evaluation as a, as a review of every error they've made in the past year. And we don't even mention it unless it's really good, which often it is. Or if it's on the other end of the curve, if it's really bad, we may um, give them a lower score on accuracy and talk about it then. But 90% of the time, we don't even talk about errors at the time of the performance review. <clears throat> a critical control point is um, an area of the failure of which or loss of control over may adversely affect the safety, purity, potency of the blood bank. I'm sorry about all the blood bank references, but that's my background. And so we build critical control points into our SOPs. We put big <laughs> asterisks. This is a critical control point. Here's four of them listed to prevent from um, doing a blood typing error. <clears throat> Here's an example of blood issue. The computer allows them to select a unit by checking the box, but we insist, and it's a critical control point, that they scan the unit so we know they have the right unit in their hand. And if they willingly, if they know that and they willingly disregard that, that could be cause for discipline because this is one of our critical control points that they know about. Okay, so let's um, shift gears and talk about um, uh, KIQs and how we select our KIQs. So we meet... Um, or how we review our NCEs, sorry. So the, in the general laboratory, the quality manager, the administrative director, and our blood bank director meet each month, and we pull it up on the screen, and we um, risk um, stratify these. So severity level three is potential harm, and four is actual harm. So as a group, we review severity level threes and fours, any complaints, and then the employees have the option of flagging a report for group review. We'll review all those as well. And then the medical director electronically signs those, and we can add notes and ask them for additional follow-up. In the blood bank, um, when we had a donor center, we had a blood bank quality unit, and we would review all, all, all reports um, monthly, and the medical director would electronically sign notes. Okay, now we're going to shift gears and talk about how NCEs um, can drive your selection of KIQs. Um, so... At the end of each fiscal year, uh, myself and our director and medical director meet with each manager. We trend their KIQs on the screen, and we use those to, sorry, we trend their NCEs, and then we use those to select um, some possible KIQs. Uh, you want to make sure you have data available, obviously, and um, select, you want to um, make sure when you select your KIQs that you're going to be doing something about it. So um, when you select a KIQ, make sure there's a project around it or you're going to be working on it. Otherwise, it's kind of meaningless, right? And the inspector will say, well, there, you haven't done anything about this. You're just tracking it. And that's so often people track things, but they don't try to improve it. So be cautious. Don't select too many. Put them around a major project. For example, we have we um, um, this year are installing Collection Manager, which um, is used for um, specimen labels from the armband, and we're barcoded specimen tracking and pathology. So we're um, selected our KIQs around that. And you can certainly use NCAE data to justify capital equipment. In fact, the reason we got Collection Manager is because of our mislabeled problem with nurse draws, and we were able to show that and justify it. 
Okay, so each section refreshes their KIQ data quarterly. It was monthly, and it was just too much. So now we do quarterly. We post them for the staff on a quality bulletin board. The medical director reviews and signs off. And then each section presents one of their KIQs monthly at our quality council meeting. And when we trended our KIQs for this fiscal year across the lab, and this is very easy to do with an electronic system, guess what the number one problem was? It was involved sample quality. No surprise there, right? So hemolyzed, clotted, QNS, and contaminated was our number one, followed by incorrect results, mislabeled samples. We're doing something about that this year with um, our collection manager system, and then delays in turnaround time. So those were our four majors. And we'll, we looked at our top five severity level threes and fours, potential or actual harm. Contaminated samples is our number one. <clears throat> and then this is just a drill down on one of the sections, on the microbiology sections. Uh, mislabeled, incorrect results, extra blood culture, something they're, not, they're tracking. <clears throat> so this was our selection of KIQs for our fiscal year. And the ones, again, in orange are ones that we uh, mined from our NCE data and are um, tracking through our NCE data. And I won't read all those off. This is the format that we use. It's just a PowerPoint slide. We have background, the data source, the conclusion, and the action plan and follow-up, and the data. And we post those on the board, and the medical director signs off on those. <clears throat> this is kind of a drill down. This is one of our um, pet projects this year is working on hemolyzed samples. And this is an example of where trending will help you decide what to do. So when we trended by location, guess what? It's the ED where <laughs> all the hemolyzed samples are coming from. Why? Because they're drawing them through um, catheters. So we really want to um, address this problem because it's a lot of rework. And then my pet peeve is contaminated samples, right? Why? Because it's 100% preventable. So we're going to try to do an education um, around not drawing above an IV and how to prevent contaminated samples. And they're also very scary because they can cause erroneous results. And if you don't detect them, it can cause inappropriate treatment. So we looked at our uh, specimen rejection rate and benchmark it trying to um, meet that requirement for benchmarking. So when we looked at the emergency room, um, rejected specimens due to hemolyzed, contaminated, clotted, or QNS, it was 0.8%, while the rest of um, the departments outside of the nursing was 0.23%, and for lab draws, it was 0.20%. So the benchmark from a CAPQ probe is 0.35%. So the only people not meeting benchmark are the um, nursing draws, and again, it's because of the catheter problem. And one we're working on um, very hard that's going to be an easy win is clotted um, heel stick samples up in the nursery. It's happening both with lab draws and nursing draws, so it's not just nursing. So, so we're trying out some new lancets, and we're doing a whole education campaign around that to try to prevent it. Nursing gets very upset. They're convinced that we're clotting it in the lab. So the first thing we had to do is start with the axiom that clotting doesn't happen in the lab. It happens at the bedside. So we're trying to turn this into a real positive win-win because they get very upset when they have to redraw the babies. And we have a couple of staff that serve as lab ambassadors. So we sent them out to establish relationships with the nurse educators, and we're trying to work through the lab ambassadors. And this is going to be a really easy win. We're going to provide monthly updates with this until we can really decrease this problem. And we're engaging BD, which is our uh, vendor, to do the education and buy the food, because food is the key to success if you're trying to get everybody together. So this was some data around hemolyzed samples that were, was presented at this very conference in 2011. Um, that we're really looking at um, out of Florida, they had the same problem. They had a hemolysis rate of 10.4% in their ED. And the majority of those were drawn from a catheter. And so they um, began an education program with the ED on ways to prevent that. Um, they did a policy change where a catheter draws were only allowed at the time of insertion. They had BD examine the equipment they used. There is some equipment that's associated with less hemolysis from catheter draws. And their hemolysis rate fell from 10% to 3.2%, and they still weren't satisfied with that because they were looking to meet a benchmark of 2%. And so they implemented a pilot program where phlebotomists were assigned to the ED pods, and they eliminated catheter draws, and lo and behold, the hemolysis rate fell to 0.2%. And in one of their ex, um, unexpected findings was that drawing samples prior to order entry, so when the patient comes in, they start the IV, they draw a rainbow, actually increase the turnaround time, right? Because they'd have to call the lab, say, add on testing to this rainbow that I drew. They'd have to find the samples. It was a mess. 
And so we're trying to do a similar thing based on this um, data that was presented at this conference in 2011, and they actually won an award for this project. But ED is a very difficult place to work with. They're very high volume. They're concentrating on throughput. Um, they're very resistant, and uh, I understand. It's a very complex um, environment, but we're doing our best to try to address this problem. And the problem is that most of the draws in ED, most of those rainbows are thrown in the trash can, right? So out of um, over 4,000 extra tubes that were drawn in ED, only 6% were used. The rest of them were thrown away. So my, my medical director is concerned about iatrogenic blood loss, and it's a big waste of resource. So this is another uh, tack that we're taking with them. Hey, we're throwing most of those extra samples away. Um, we use a DMAIC model when we um, um, take one of those KIQs and form a project around it. Um, there's many focused PDCA you may be familiar with the make. It's more of a simple one. Uh, define the problem, describe the goals for improvement, determine the root cause, describe your changes, and describe how you're going to um, control and monitor. So it's a little simpler than a lot of the um, lean and focused PDCA. <clears throat> this is sort of a gold standard. Um, I stole this screenshot from Seattle Children's Hospital is to have a dashboard with green, red, and yellow lights, and you can click on any of these links and, and get at the actual data. Um, certainly something I'm striving for, not there yet. I'm, there might, there's commercial products out there, I think, that can provide you with a dashboard as well. Okay, so for those of you that still have a paper system, CLSI put out a document on desired features of an electronic event management system. It should be accessible to everyone at the desktop. You should be able to customize it with your own codes. You're able to use it for all categories, actual errors, injuries, complaints, ability to categorize the type of event, ability to um, assign a tracking number, um, ability to send notification to people for follow-up, ability to send reminders on a specified date, which I'll talk about in a moment, provision of read-only access to all reports, ability to generate printed reports, and user-friendly customization of the report. So there's um, vendors out there, and I'll show you some of those in a moment, but these are some things you should keep in mind when selecting. These are some of my own that I added to the list. Um, certainly in the blood bank, the um, final review sign-off has to be an official electronic signature, not necessarily so in the lab, but certainly if you're going to use it for your blood bank system and the FDA is going to be looking at it, make sure that it's electronic signature compliant. I don't know the exact term for that, but um, ours has the ability to store supporting documentation so we can scan in copies of the label and it's, it lives with the report. Um, our blood bank system, we don't do this for the lab ones, but the blood bank system, we actually sit down with the employee and record their recollection of the event. Um, we have a reportable BPD countdown clock, so if we term it reportable, it starts a 45-day clock um, and constantly reminds us every time we log in that we have a reportable event to get to the FDA. Um, coding, um, ability to make up your own categories and use um, and assign a severity level is also very helpful when you're drilling down. Our blood bank system actually uses the BPD categories that are defined by the FDA. And then I can't emphasize this enough. If you're putting all this in, you need to have the ability to get it out without writing a crystal report. I, for one, cannot write crystal reports. <laughs> it's very complicated. Um, whatever system you choose, make sure that um, you have trending with that system. These are some of the commercial products that are out there. I'm sure some of the vendors will be here. The first four are lab-specific. Um, the rest of them are sort of aimed at the manufacturing industry as a whole, but I'm sure you could use them. I think I'm done, so we'll have some time for discussion. I think I hurried through. So some of my conclusions. Um, an NCE program is certainly required by all of the regulatory agencies. BPDs have become a really um, cornerstone of FDA investigations, at least on the West Coast. When the FDA investigator comes in, oftentimes the first thing they ask for is um, to review your BPDs. And whether they're reportable or not, they're going to look at your root cause. They're going to make sure you have an SOP that covers that step. They're going to make sure that you have had sufficient corrective action, and they're going to look for trends. And if you have an error that's repeating over and over again, they're going to cite you for that if you haven't um, corrected that. I think um, developing a just culture um, is the key to success. So, um, and that requires supporting that employee every time you sit down with them. 
um, openly sharing all your errors. We talked about that and celebrating your successes. Um, and no key, you know, try to separate discipline from the error reporting system. And again, assume good intentions. The employees want to do the right things. Um, sometimes they just make mistakes. So um, an occurrence reporting information system can bring order and structure to the NCE process. It will definitely increase the number of reports. It's on everybody's desktop. We had over 6,000 NCEs filed last year by the employees. It will direct steps involved in a root cause analysis. So in our blood bank system, if we choose the contributing factor of competency, the system requires documentation of retraining. So it will direct um, how you do that root cause. It requires us to um, attach our SOP that was involved. Um, it will also provide the ability to trend large amounts of data. If you're doing this on paper, even if you're entering them into a spreadsheet, that's a lot of work, and I suggest that it may not be very effective. Um, certainly, it will fulfill regulatory requirements for reporting. And so that ability to trend, I hope I've demonstrated, can really um, help you select what you're going to work on. It'll help you um, determine risk. Where is our system at risk? Where are our patients at, at risk? How do I want to spend our increasingly limited quality improvement resources on a problem? That is all determined from trending data. It will identify needed systems changes. It will help you keep your SOPs current um, because you're going to review the SOP that was involved in the error and you're going to make it current if it wasn't. And we hold ourselves accountable to that. Um, really, the, the greatest thing is the ability to provide audit data to the nursing staff. So when we're looking at contaminated samples, I'll send a report to that nurse manager and say, here's some contaminated samples that came from your nursing unit. So. Um, Without an electronic system, again, it's, it's difficult to do that. It is an objective assessment of employee performance. So however you cut it, um, the employee that makes 40 errors during the year is not performing as well as the employee that made zero errors. So how you use that is up to you, um, but certainly it can be an objective measure. And that employee that made 40 errors, you may want to mention that at the time of performance review, and it should reflect on their scores, right? Um, and it will certainly help you select your KIQs and, um, again, prioritize your limited resources. And it can also be um, used for capital equipment justification. So this is um, Roger Boyce Jolie. He was an engineer at Morton Thiokol. Maybe somebody, some of you know his story, but he was an American Association for the Advancement of Science, Scientific Freedom and Responsibility Award winner. So um, in February of 85, he noticed on po post-flight examination revealed eroded and leaking seals on our solid rocket booster and found that that problem was that the O-rings didn't seat properly at low temperature. And he tried to tell everybody about this problem. He presented it three times at increasingly higher levels of review boards. The next um, challenger, the next launch of the space shuttle in June 98, 1985, while there was no um, explosion, he again saw that seal erosion. In July of 1986, he wrote a warning memo to the VP of Engineering. And then um, at the, on the date of the Challenger loss in January 27, he attempted to stop the launch, which was, again, overridden by four, four managers because they were under a lot of pressure to launch. He returned to his office and actually recorded his statement in his journal. I sincerely hope that this launch does not result in a catastrophe. And then we're all familiar with what happened. The Challenger um, exploded. Um, we lost seven astronauts. And the Presidential Commission concluded faults include a lack of problem reporting requirements and inadequate trend analysis. So um, certainly, um, we don't want harm to come to patients. We need to identify through our NCE system where our systems are weak and really rally our um, increasingly limited quality improvement resources around preventing those errors from reaching the patient. And I provided you with some references there. And um, I think we're ready for questions. This is my dog, Rika, and my little teardrop camper, which we enjoy exploring uh, the Sierras and the West Coast in our camper. So we like to go camping. So I'll open this to any discussion or questions. Maybe some of, some of you guys can share how you use um, your NCE system. Yeah. That's such a great question. Um, we do. We have the MIDAS system. Is anybody using MIDAS out there? You're using MIDAS. So if it escapes the laboratory, we also report it in MIDAS. But if, we, if it's only internal, we don't. And there's some um, risk management 
may or may not like that, but that's that's been our approach. That's a great question. <clears throat> Anybody else? Anybody want to share how what kind of electronic system you use and how you're using it? Yeah, so the question was an incident occurs, what's the, how is it investigated and what kind of timeline do you have? So I try to um, log in every day and review the incidents, um, but they are reviewed monthly by the medical director, the administrative director, and myself. Um, we will review it in a, on a macro level. And um, to be honest with you, the, the timeliness hasn't been good on some of the minor ones in the lab because there's such a, a volume and the managers are so busy. But what we've started to do is assign our um, sort of our senior techs. We're, we're um, delegating review of these. They bring them up to an unsigned status and then I pull them up on the screen and sign, 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 sign and just look for trends. So um, certainly um, in the blood bank though, you wanna be more mindful of closing those out in a very timely manner. And 45 days is the benchmark for those. So I think we're more, in tune to closing out the blood bank ones, and it has been an issue of not getting the um, general lab ones closed out in a timely manner. So we're trying to start um, holding the managers accountable, and at our monthly review, we can do a couple clicks and know how many are unsigned, and we'll share that data with them. So, But we don't have a specific timeline um, assigned. So good question, because it has been a little bit of a problem. How about you? Are you having problems with that as well, getting them? Yes. 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 Exactly. Yes. Us too. 